Let's talk about Division III now. Hello, I am Louise McCleary, Director of Division III at the NCAA. I'm going to introduce you to a few key facts about Division III and the unique experience it offers its student athletes. Division III is the largest membership division in the NCAA. With more than 445 schools and 43 conferences, Division III also has the most student athletes, more than 175,000. Approximately 40% of the NCAA's member schools and student athletes are in Division III. Why is Division III so popular? Division III athletics provides a well-rounded collegiate experience that involves a balance of rigorous academics, competitive athletics, and the opportunity to pursue the multitude of other co-curricular and extracurricular opportunities offered on Division III campuses. Division III places an emphasis on minimizing conflicts between athletics and academics, allowing student athletes to focus on their academic programs and ultimately achieve a degree. Division III limits playing and practice seasons, contests, redshirting, and out-of-season team activities to help minimize conflicts with academics. Division III offers an intense and competitive athletics environment. Division III doesn't allow athletic scholarships, so student athletes play for the love of the game without the obligation of an athletic scholarship. However, it is important to note that three quarters of all Division III student athletes receive some form of financial aid or non-athletic scholarship. Division III athletic departments place special importance on the positive impact of athletics on its participants rather than on the spectators. The student athlete's experience is of paramount concern. Division III athletics departments are dedicated to offering broad-based programs with a high number and wide range of athletics participation opportunities for both men and women. There is an emphasis on regional in-season and conference competition, while also offering 36 national championships annually. In fact, Division III offers a higher number and a wider variety of athletics opportunities per student than any other division in the NCAA. Finally, Division III gives student athletes the opportunity to discover valuable lessons in teamwork, discipline, perseverance, and leadership, which in turn makes student athletes better students and responsible citizens. Division III student athletes are integrated into campus life. They meet the same admission and academic standards as the general student body. Student athletes are encouraged to take advantage of the many opportunities available to them, both within and beyond athletics, so that they may develop their full potential as students, athletes, and citizens. I hope you enjoyed learning more about Division III, a division that is unique within the NCAA. Thank you. Welcome to the Summary of Regulations video breakdown. The videos in this section are designated to guide you through the Summary of NCAA Regulations. These are the forms that you need to complete in order to participate in Division III Athletics. Each video will provide you with an overview of the NCAA rules and the highlights of that section of the forms. But remember, there is more detail on the forms than what we talk about here. So make sure you use both what is in front of you and these videos to help you because you are responsible for knowing and understanding all the information in the summary of regulations. You might feel like you're already familiar with this information, but there are a lot of areas to go over. So whether you are a new student athlete or you've done this before, it's important to take your time and make sure to read everything before signing. If there's something you don't understand, don't be afraid to ask questions to get clarity on what you're signing. Don't just sign off on the forms without getting the answers to any questions you may have. One more thing, it's called a summary for a reason. Today, you'll be going over the general regulations, but many NCAA rules have exceptions and distinctions. What's okay for someone else to do may not be okay for you. That's why when it comes to things that may impact your athletics eligibility, you should always ask before you act. The administrator in the room will tell you about the proper individuals on your campus who can answer questions related to NCAA bylaws and eligibility issues. At the end of this process, we hope that you will be comfortable with the forms you are signing and know where you need to go when you need more information. Let's get started. The 
following video discusses the section of the summary of regulations regarding seasons of participation. In general, each student has four seasons of athletics in college for sport. For example, four seasons for soccer, four seasons for basketball, four seasons for baseball, and so on. The idea of using a season in Division Three is different than in Division One and Division Two, where a season is measured by competition only. In Division Three, we measure part by participation, which includes competition and practice. This means there is no redshirting in Division Three. There are two ways that you can trigger using a season in Division Three. First, you'll use a season if you compete in any game, even if you only play for the first quarter or the last inning. Even one second of competition will count. There are a few notable exceptions here. You haven't used your season if you compete in a scrimmage that takes place during the preseason. You also get a break from the rule if your team plays on one day of competition during the offseason, what we call the non-traditional segment. The second way to use a season is if you, part if you practice at any point after your team's first regular season game. Practicing only counts in the regular season. So you can practice during the off season in fall ball or spring soccer, for example, and not use a season of participation. Once you've triggered your using your season, if you have a season ending injury, you might meet the criteria to get that season back for medical reasons. This is called a medical hardship waiver. Getting a medical hardship isn't typical, but it does happen from time to time. If you have any other questions as your season progresses, make sure to talk to your administrator. Take a moment to review the information in this section of your summary of regulations now. This video corresponds to the section of the Summary of Regulations about financial aid. A key principle in the philosophy of Division III is that student athletes should be integrated into the campus culture. Part of this integration includes having the same access to financial aid as the rest of the student body. For this reason, Division III does not award financial aid based on athletics leadership, ability, performance, or participation. If you are receiving financial aid from anyone other than your school or your parent or legal guardian, you must report that aid to your school. It's important for you to realize that the Division III rules apply to that financial aid as well. This means that scholarships you receive from outside organizations may not be based on athletics and accepting one could jeopardize your eligibility. In certain very limited situations, this might be okay, but you won't know unless you talk to your administrator first. Remember, to safeguard your eligibility, always ask before you act. Take a look at this section of the Summary of Regulations now. This video will walk you through the next section of the Summary of Regulations, which deals with academic standards. Under the Division III rules, in order to be eligible to practice and compete, you must be enrolled full-time and be in good academic standing at your school. Good academic standing is determined by your institution, so it varies from school to school. Your athletics conference may have its own academic rules in addition to the NCAA rules. You can find out by checking with your administrator. In addition, to be eligible to compete, you must be enrolled in at least 12 credits. Make sure to keep this in mind when you are adding and dropping classes. Always add the new class before you drop the old one, because once you drop below 12 credits, you're no longer eligible to compete. The only time it's safe to be enrolled in less than 12 credits is when you're in your last semester or quarter and will graduate at the end of that term. Even then, there are specific requirements that you must meet, so make sure you review your situation with your administrators first. Remember, always ask before you act. Please review the corresponding sections of your Summary of Regulations now. This video will discuss the section of the Summary of Regulations that pertains to some additional eligibility requirements that you should know. In the NCAA, your eligibility is made up of two parts, your time to be able to participate and your seasons, which are your opportunities to participate. 
Whichever of those that runs out first is what ends your eligibility. In Division 3, you have 10 full-time semesters or 15 quarters of time to use, your, use four seasons of eligibility. Each term you are enrolled full-time counts as one, and the summer doesn't count. If you take time off from school or you're only enrolled part-time, that won't count towards your time. If you are full-time at any point during that semester or quarter, even if it's only for one day, that will count as a full-time semester or quarter. That means that if you start out the term enrolled full-time and then you drop down to part-time, that term is still going to count as one of your 10 semesters or 15 quarters. Next, let's talk about transferring. A good piece of information to know is that you can't transfer out of trouble, either academic or athletic problems. If you are having issues at your current school, it is possible that those troubles will follow you and you won't be able to complete right away at your new school. You may also have noticed that now that you are enrolled in college, you aren't being recruited by other schools anymore. That's because other schools are not allowed to contact you about transferring unless you have been released to talk with them. There are a couple ways an institution can get permission to talk with you. First, if you are interested in transferring to another Division III school, you can do it yourself by simply sending a self-release. This self-release is accessible on the NCAA website. Complete this form, date it, and send it to the institutions where you are interested in transferring. The second way involves a situation where you are interested in transferring to a Division I or Division II school. In this instance, you can't use the self-release. You will have to see your athletics director and ask for the ability to contact other schools. He or she will be able to grant the other schools permission to talk to you about transferring. If you decide that you want to transfer, you will have to meet certain requirements to be able to play right away at your new school. These requirements are different for each division, but you can review the, tra the transfer rules that apply when you are transferring to a Division III school and the information on the forms in front of you. For example, if you are a grad student, you typically can't transfer to a Division III school and be eligible to play. Take a look at this section of the Summary of Regulations now. The following video explains the Summary of Regulations section on drug testing. The NCAA has a list of banned substances. If you are tested and are found to be using one of these compounds, it may affect your eligibility. If you test positive on an NCAA drug test, you are required to sit out for a year and you also lose at least one of your seasons. You can lose even more eligibility or even become permanently ineligible if you test positive more than once. You might also have consequences with the NCAA if you are suspended by a different sports organization. It isn't just steroids and street drugs like heroin or marijuana that are on the list, so watch out. For example, some energy drinks may make you test positive for stimulants and elevated levels of caffeine. To make sure you stay out of trouble, ask before you act. Talk to your athletic training staff before you take anything, even supplements, over-the-counter stuff, and potentially even prescriptions, just to be safe. The list of banned substances can change, so be sure to review it each academic year and always seek help from your athletic training staff. Take a few minutes now and review this information in the Summary of Regulations. The next area of the Summary of Regulations is for new student athletes only. This video will walk you through the sections on recruitment. If you are a first year student athlete, these sections of the forms go over things that may have happened during recruiting. It is important that you read this information carefully and ask any questions that you may have because the result could have an impact on your eligibility. As you review these sections, remember the ethical conduct rules we talked about earlier. Think about any interactions you or your parent or guardian had with athletic staff when you were being recruited, any special treatment or benefits you may have been offered or received, and any situations where you took a visit to a campus. Review the corresponding sections of your Summary of Regulations now.
Once you have completed reading through the summary of regulations, you will be instructed to sign the student athlete statement. Just as we did with the summary of regulations, we will walk through the signature pages of the student athlete statement so you will understand what you are signing. When this video is complete, you will be given time to read the sections, sign them, and hand them back to your administrator. Before completing the signature pages, make sure to read the forms in full prior to signing. Your signature represents your knowledge and understanding of all the information in those documents. So if you have any questions, it's important to make sure they are answered before you sign. Let's begin. In part one of the student athlete statement, you are confirming that you have read the summary of regulations and are eligible to compete. Please remember to list every sport in which you are participating at the collegiate level and list your full birth date with the day, month, and year. The second section of the forms provides information about the Buckley Amendment. By signing this page, you are agreeing to let your school release your personal information and education records in order to certify your eligibility. Part 3 of the Summary of Regulations is a release that allows the NCAA to use your name or picture to promote NCAA championships or other events. There are three sections in Part 4. You will be signing only two of the three sections, so please pay careful attention. You will not sign both Part A and Part B. You will sign only one of those two options. Go slowly through this section to make sure you're signing the correct part. You will sign Section A if you have never tested positive for banned substances in a test administered by the NCAA or another athletics organization, like the NAIA or USOC. Please note, this section is not asking about drug tests you may have taken as part of a job. This section also does not apply to institutional drug testing results. That means if you are tested as part of your school's own drug testing program and tested positive, you can still sign A. This section only relates to NCAA drug tests. If you are tested by the NCAA, by an international athletics organization, or by a non-NCAA athletics organization, and you tested positive, you must sign Part B. Finally, everyone will sign Part C. This section explains that if you test positive for a banned substance in a test administered by the NCAA, or another athletics organization, you are required to report the, result, the test results to your athletics director. Your athletics director will then report this information to the NCAA. This concludes your guided tour of the Summary of Regulations. Please review the information in the forms in front of you carefully, complete, and sign your student athlete statement. Good luck with school and have a great season. Hello, I'm Tucker Glass, member of the NCAA Division III National Student Athlete Advisory Committee and lacrosse student athlete at Plattsburgh State University of New York. Today we will walk through the basics of creating an effective SAC for your campus or conference office. First, what is SAC? A Student Athlete Advisory Committee, also known as SAC, is a committee made up of student athletes who provide insight on the student athlete experience. The SAC offers input on the rules, regulations, and policies that affect student athletes' lives. There are three levels of SAC, one at the campus level in which each Division III institution administers its own, one at the conference level which is made up of representatives from each institution in the conference, and finally one at the national level where student athletes, athletes from selected conferences represent the entire division. The membership of your SAC should be representative of your, student, of your institution's population and involves student athletes from diverse sports. For example, at Plattsburgh, our SAC elects two members from each team to serve on the committee and, li and as liaisons between the SAC and his or her team teams. The membership of your SAC should be representative of your, of your institution's population and involve student athletes from diverse sports. For example, at Plattsburgh, our SAC elects two members from each team to serve on the committee and as liaisons between the SAC and his or her teams. So now that you have a SAC roster, what is this group supposed to do? The purpose of a SAC may vary across conferences and institutions. However, the following should serve as basic guidelines when developing a SAC and a strategic plan. 
A SAC should generate a student athlete voice and perspective within the institution and within the conference. Review and respond to proposed NCAA legislation and support the community through outreach efforts with a primary focus on the NCAA Division III SAC and Special Olympics Partnership. Please see the NCAA Division III SAC informational guide on the Division III homepage for additional information. One of the most important components of a successful SAC is communication. It is imperative that communication between the athletic department, SAC advisor, and student athlete representatives is encouraging, frequent, and substantive. Also, it is important to partner with your athletic communications office or sports information director to help in sharing the outstanding efforts of the SAC and the rest of your student athletes. Effective communication tools are vital to a successful SAC and for a smooth transition from year to year. Here are a few recommendations. First, create and maintain a SAC roster. Make sure the roster includes contact information, sport, term, and other committee or officer appointments, and other important SAC contacts, such as the athletic director, SAC advisor, and athletic communications office. Another great tool is a SAC-specific website. This webpage should highlight committee information, such as a roster, calendar of events, and stories and photos from your community service efforts. Lastly, each SAC member is encouraged to keep a binder or electronic folder regarding his or her SAC activities, as well as the agendas, minute, minutes, and notes from each meeting. This resource will provide a historical record for new SAC representatives and should be passed from old to new members. Please see the NCAA Division III SAC informational guide on the Division III homepage for additional information. I'm Delaine Whitlock, member of NCAA Division III National Student Athlete Advisory Committee and soccer student athlete at Concordia University in Texas. Today, let's talk about how to best run your campus or conference SAC. What are the priorities? What would create the biggest impact? Well, one of the most important responsibilities of a SAC is to review and discuss the annual legislative grids. These grids describe the proposed legislation that will be voted on at the annual January NCAA convention and many of the issues relate directly to student-athlete well-being. Each SAC will receive these grids in early fall to review and also take a position on each piece of legislation. Your national SAC representative will then compile all positions and share them at their November meeting. These positions form the basis for the national SAC's position papers at convention and are integral to having the student-athlete voice heard when the membership votes. The other priority for SAC is community service, especially the partnership with Special Olympics. The Division III SAC initiated a partnership with Special Olympics at the 2011 NCAA Convention. The purpose of the partnership is to improve the lives of Special Olympics athletes through their involvement with Division III student athletes and to foster a mutual learning experience. This partnership is powerful for all those who participate, so we encourage each campus and conference SAC to conduct at least one Special Olympics event each academic year. Whether you choose to host a Special Olympics sports clinic, organize a bowling outing, or invite local Special Olympics athletes to games as VIPs, make sure to use the planning guide on ncaa.org slash D3 Special Olympics to initiate a Special Olympics event. Additional resources for planning your event are also available here. Hi everyone, my name is Isaiah Goodman and I want to extend a special welcome on behalf of all Division III student athletes. I'm a recent graduate of Washington and Lee University and a former basketball student athlete. Today I'm introducing information related to student athlete reinstatement. The videos that accompany this introduction focus on the student athlete reinstatement process and identify several ways student athletes may become ineligible and prevented from further participation with the team until reinstated by the NCAA. It is the hope that you will find the student athlete reinstatement videos educational, a source of guidance to ensure student athletes remain on the playing field instead of on the sidelines. So let's get started by looking at a couple scenarios where Division III student athletes have become ineligible.
Remember that supplement John had before his workout the other day? That supplement has a substance that is on the NCAA's banned substance list. And at championship play, John failed a drug test. Now he's sitting on the sideline at the NCAA championship because he did not check with the athletic training staff before using a supplement. Make sure you check the NCAA's banned substance list and with your trainer before taking any supplements or you too could find yourself on the sideline. <music> How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Uh, I'm actually, I'm not that good right now. I'm not excited about soccer. I'm not excited about practice. I feel like coach is just ignoring me. She won't play me. She won't put me in. I don't know what to do. Well, it's going past the bulletin board today. I found some information about a league soccer club. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, do the games interfere with our games? No, they don't. You can actually go to practice, leave practice, and go to the games. Huh. So I could probably play more there then, huh? Yeah, get some awesome practice time in. Okay, well I'm gonna look into this. Thanks, yeah. Jane. If you're in, I'm in. All right, cool. Sounds good. These student athletes played on an outside team during their team's regular season. It is important to check with your coach before participating on another team because playing on an outside team may cause you to find yourself on the sideline. Thanks so much. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Come on up. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I was at your game last night. You guys played great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I try to go to all the games. I'm such a huge supporter of the athletic program here. I think you guys do so much for the school. In fact, let me just take care of this for you. Are you sure this is like $100 worth of stuff? Yeah, but you deserve it. Here you go. Thanks. Have a great season. Wow. Thanks. Sure. Although the clerk had good intentions by providing the merchandise for free to the student athlete, by accepting the merchandise without paying for it, this student athlete just accepted an impermissible extra benefit. Check with your coach or an athletics administrator before accepting something for free or at a reduced price that isn't available to students generally. Taking advantage of your status on campus as an athlete to receive extra benefits is an NCA violation and may cause you to find yourself on the sideline. <music> I did after practice. I couldn't believe it. Must have been even. <sighs> Failed another biology exam, guys. I don't know what I'm gonna have to do here. I mean, this is classes right after practice, and I'm, I'm just struggling. I, I really think I'm gonna have to drop this class. Well, if you drop the class now, you could take the lab in the summer, and it wouldn't interfere with your practice or your games. Yeah, I think I'm definitely gonna have to drop this class today. In fact, I think I'll take care of it right now. So, I'll see you guys later, all right? See you, yeah. Jason. See ya. Hello. Hello. I actually need to drop a biology class. Can oh, I have a... so you need to drop that form? Yes, please. Thank you. Jimmy dropped biology without checking with his academic advisor or coach because he did not do well on any of the tests. After he dropped the course, he was enrolled in just two four-credit courses, removing him from full-time status. Generally, student-athletes must take a full load in order to participate in athletics. Make sure you know how many credits make you a full-time student, or you could find yourself on the sideline. 